بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد concerning the issue of the rahma of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam towards the women then those ayat that we mentioned in the very first class the very first session the clear indicators that he was sent as a rahma to the women وَمَا أَرُسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah mentioned we have not sent you except as a rahmah to all of the worlds, to everything that exists. And clearly from what exists are those women. So when the Nabi came with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he liberated the women with a liberation that has been sanctioned by Allah, authored by Allah. The liberation that gave them the ability to live. Because when he came, they didn't even have the ability to live. She didn't have a choice. She didn't have a say concerning her right to live, to exist. Men took that right away from her. Her society, the men who ran the society, the men of her family, her father, they snuffed her life out just like that. Allah mentioned this in many ayahs of the Quran. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَثِينٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَيُمْسِكُهُ عَلَى هُونًا أَمْ يُدُسُّهُ فِي التُّرَابِ أَلَا سَأَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ When one of them, meaning Quraysh, before Islam, when one of the men of Quraysh, when they were informed and they were told that they had been the recipients of a girl child, they would run away and hide from their people and their faces would become black in disgust. And they used to ponder, will I keep her and be embarrassed or should I bury her in the sand? Allah said in the end of the ayah, and what a terrible decision they decided to make. Because usually the decision was they would bury her alive. And if you were to ask them, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, why did you bury that girl alive? The answer would be, I don't know. It's because this is what my fathers used to do. She had no rights. In the times of Al-Jahiliyyah, she didn't have the right to get married to who she wanted to get married to. She didn't have the right to get divorced. If she got into a marriage and she wanted to get out of the marriage, she couldn't get out of the marriage. She had no rights whatsoever. She wasn't even a second thought in the society of Quraysh, absolutely no rights. The woman during that time, if her husband died and she became a widow, the process of mourning the husband is called al-ihdad. In al-Islam, it's called al-ihdad. A wife can mourn her husband for four months and 10 days. That's what the Quran says. As for everyone else, three days, that's it. If the mother loses her son, the mother loses someone, the daughter, the mother has three days to mourn and then after that, she has to get on with her life. Doesn't mean she can't be sad. It means though you can't be incapacitated. You can't be a person who just, you can't function. After three days, you have to get up and get out and about and get on with your life. The lady has four months and 10 days to get herself together. In Jahiliya, if a lady was widowed, she had to go in her husband's house or some house that they designated for her and she couldn't wash, she couldn't bathe as a sign of her respect and her devotion to her husband. And if that wasn't enough, they would throw a dead carcass inside of the house with her and she had to stay in the house with the dead carcass while, you know, the dead body of an animal, while the animal started to smell and it got worse and worse and worse and she had to stay in that situation. She couldn't wash and she couldn't leave. And then after her dad was over, when she came out, the morning period came, was up, the brothers of the husband would determine what they're going to do with her. If one of them wanted to marry her, they would marry her. If they wanted to keep her for themselves and not let her get married to anyone and they don't marry her, they would do that. If they wanted to give her freedom, they would say, okay, you can go free, but your children belong to us. She had no rights. And then the Nabi came, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that society, 
and he brought some rules and some regulations and he brought a way of life, a system that was diametrically opposed to the oppression of Quraysh and he liberated her and he had Rahmah on her. So as we've been doing, giving you examples of him having Rahmah on his enemies, him having Rahmah upon the slaves, him having Rahmah upon the young people, the Shabab, there are ample examples of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Rahmah upon the women. Now again, non-Muslims many times are victims of their own ignorance. They don't know the reality of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, either because they don't read or what they're reading is false material or they look at the Muslims and the Muslims give them a bad image. The program that came on Channel 4 the other day about Islam in Bradford. If you look at those Muslims who are on that program, then I'm not totally against the program. I thought it was an interesting program. But the people who are on the program who represent the religion of Islam, it gives a picture about Islam and the Muslims that is not the correct opinion. The guy who kept having to go to the masjid and pray and pray and pray like that. The people say, you see, it's the Muslims who can't get along and so forth and so on. So similar to that right now, the woman is oppressed in Islam, but it's the culture that oppresses the woman. It's the parents that oppress her. It's the Mirpuri culture that oppresses her. It's the Afghani culture. It's the Arab culture. It's the African culture. But it's not just something that's exclusive to us Muslims. Europeans, they oppress the woman. America, they oppress the woman. The woman is oppressed. So how did the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give us some practical examples of his rahmah to the women? In addition to what we already said, the fact that he came to protect them and to give them life, as Allah mentioned in another ayat of the Quran, the infant girl that was buried alive, she's going to be asked, Yomul Qiyamah, for what sin, what crime were you killed for? That made the men of this ummah, people who embrace Islam, that makes them understand. If you kill this girl and you take her life away, you're going to be held accountable for that Yomul Qiyamah. So don't do it. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the people, Uharraj alaykum haqq al-da'ifain. I want you men to be conscious. I want you men to take into consideration. I want you men to be considerate about the haqq, giving the haqq to the two weak people of the community, the orphan and the woman. Be conscious of your wife, be conscious of your daughter, and so forth and so on. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he told the people of this ummah, the men, before his death and during the course of his dawah, istaw su bin nisa khayra. I'm encouraging you and I'm advising you people to do khair to the women. And that's a general statement. Women means your mother, your daughter, your sister, your niece, your aunt from your mother's side, your father's side. It's the woman in general. And the Nabi did that, sallallahu alayhi wa as you're going to see. The rahmah of the Nabi for the woman, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is clearly illustrated to us in the fact that he said in an authentic hadith that we want you brothers and you sisters to take seriously. Getting knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. You can't leave yourself ignorant about the deen. You don't have to be an imam. You don't have to be a half of the sab. You don't have to get the khutbah. But don't be ignorant to the degree where you don't know what you're doing. Someone came and asked you why. You don't know why about anything. So he said getting knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. Every Muslim includes Arab, non-Arab, black, white, rich, poor, man, woman. Because with knowledge, a person has the ability to exist and to navigate through this hayat of the dunya and in his religion, and he knows what he's doing. He'll know how to worship Allah. She'll know how to worship Allah. Knows how to get married, knows how to get divorced, knows how to welcome the newborn child, knows what they're doing. If a person doesn't know what he's doing, he or she can do a lot of, a lot of efforts, a lot of efforts. And then Yom Al-Qiyamah, they come, and those efforts were for nothing because they didn't know what they were doing. So the fact that the Nabi told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. That's his rahmah to the women. Telling that girl, learn your religion, Amatullah. Learn your religion. And he just didn't say that. He just didn't say that. 
pay attention. In Al Medina, right now, there is a door in Al Medina. That door was present during the time of the Prophet. ﷺ. That door is called Bab and Nisa, the door of the women. That was the door where the women went in to the masjid and they came out. That was the door that allowed them to have access to the knowledge of the masjid. There's a lady, her name was Um Hani. Um Hani said, I memorized Surah Al Qaf from the mouth of the Nabi. He used to read it on Friday during the Khutbah Al Jummah. Qaf wal Quran al Majid. It's a long surah. She memorized that because she used to go to the masjid and she kept hearing it over and over and over and over again. The Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't just tell men and women, get knowledge. The lady came and said, Ya Rasulullah, the men always have access to you so that you can talk to them. Give us a day. So what did he do? He chose a specific day to go to those women to answer their issues. That's rahmah for the Nisa. On the day of the Eid, he would pray the two rakats of the Eid, the Salat. After that, he would address the men. After he finished with the men, he would go to the women. And he would tell those women, Ya Ma'ashir and Nisa, Tasaddaqna, fa'inni ra'aytu kunna akthar ashab al-nar. Hey, you women, give sadaqa. Because I saw you women were the majority of the occupants of the hellfire. He just didn't leave them in a threat that they're going to go to the hellfire like that. He went to them, he educated them, he warned them, and all of those are indications of the Nabi having rahmah. The husband who brings his daughter or his wife to a class and facilitates for her knowledge, he's having rahmah for that lady. But let us look at our culture. Let us look at our culture. The messages now, many of the Asian messages, and again, I have to qualify and explain I'm not against Asians, but that's who in front of me right now. That's what I'm dealing with right now in Birmingham. In the vast majority, many of the masajid in Birmingham, there are messages that don't even have facilities for women. Woman doesn't have any access to the masjid. She's not being educated at, at home, and if she is, it's Noor TV, Medina TV, Khurafat, Bid'a, Shirk. So what happens is, if a relative dies, the woman who never goes to the masjid, and I'm, I know praying in her house is more virtuous and is better than praying in the masjid, but she still should have access because the Nabi gave the women access to the masjid and to the knowledge of the masjid and worshiping Allah in the masjid. But now, I've seen this with my own eyes. We deal with this at Green Lane. Someone dies from the Asian community and their relatives come to Green Lane. The ladies, they don't have access to the masjid. So when they come to the masjid for the janazah, they don't know what to do. They don't know that they should pray two rakats before sitting down. They don't even know. Some of them don't even pray. They don't, they don't even pray. They sit in the hallway. They sit in the chairs outside. They carry on in a way in which is not appropriate behavior in the masjid with the kalam that they have. And many times it's not because they're bad people. They just don't know. So the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had rahmah on those women. He had rahmah on them in that he made it possible for the women during his time to learn the deen. So let us look at some practical examples. As I mentioned, the woman, the woman, clearly it includes your mother, your sister, the daughter, the maternal auntie, the paternal auntie. The mother includes the ajus, the old lady. The Nabi had Rahman, the old lady. It's the jariya, the little girl, the young girl. The Nabi had Rahma on the Nisa, full stop. Concerning the mother, it's clear. One man came as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He narrated, he said that a man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, what's the most beloved deed to Allah? He said, pray in the salat at the proper time. He said, and then after that, the Nabi told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Birr Walidin, taking care of the two parents. And we know in our religion, taking care of the parents, both of them, is the second best deed to Allah after making the salah at the proper time. And from those two parents, the mother has three degrees over the father. That's the rahmah of the Nabi towards the mother. Telling every sane human being, hey, if you have a mother, even if she's difficult, your mother is one of the ways that you can get to Jannah. She has three rights over you. And ayat of the Quran have been mentioned, mentioned the mother specifically. And 
His mother carried him difficulty upon difficulty. And then after that, she gave him her milk. She suckled him for two years. That was his right. For two years, he could be suckled. So it's not mentioned ayas like that throughout the book to let people know, hey, your mother is someone who you need to be concerned about. That's the Nabi and the religion of the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Mustafa telling us, be aware of this issue. As for the daughter and the sister, and everyone has daughters, everyone has sisters. In an authentic hadith, the Nabi said about both of them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man Ali binatain, aw thalath binatin, aw ukhtain, aw thalath binatin, hatta yamutna anhu aw yamutu anhunna, he said, any person, man or woman, any person, man or woman, but usually it's the man, any man who has two daughters or three daughters, any man who has two sisters or three sisters, and he takes care of them until he dies or until they die. He dies before them or they die before him. Anyone who does that, the Nabi said, I will be like this with him, Yomul Qiyamah. And he put his fingers like this, not like that. And the reason why he split them like that is to show the close proximity. Because no one is going to be like that with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah because he has the Maqam and Mahmood. He has the special place in the Jannah al Firdos that's only for one slave, only one slave out of all of the Adam's children only one human being will get this special place and it's going to be for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi Wasallam. So the one who takes care of two daughters or three daughters, two sisters or three sisters, he dies before them or they die before him. The reward for taking care of those daughters or those sisters will be close proximity to the Nabi. So that's an encouragement from Al-Mustafa and Mukhtar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling people take care of your daughters and your sisters Concerning the khala and the amma, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam clearly indicated ikhwani al khala bi manzilat al um. Your mother's sister is just like your mother. She's one of the first people who is looked at and considered when there's an issue of custody for a child. Someone, there's an orphan, there's a child. We want to figure out who's going to take custody of the child. The father the cousin, the mother of the child has died, but her sister is here. The khala is one of the people who are considered. So the Nabi said, the khala is just like your mother. And the amma as well, the amma, here's the child's father's sister. Some man came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I made a sin, and I want to make tawbah to Allah. The Prophet said, is your mother living? He said, no. He said, is your khala living? Your mother's sister, he said, yes. He said, go to her, for her. Go to her and be kind to her. Because being kind to your khala, being kind to your amma, is a way again, just like your mother can get you to Jannah, it's a door to Jannah, path to Jannah, your khala and your amma is the same way. Another issue about the khala and the amma, and this is really critical because it shows not a hidden wisdom of Islam because it's apparent, it's right in front of our eyes, it's manifest. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا يجمع الرجل بين, عم, بين المرأة وعمتها ولا يجمع بين امرأة وخالتها It is not permissible if a man gets married and he has his wife, he's married to his wife. It's not permissible for him to marry his wife and his khala, her khala at the same time. It's not permissible for him to marry his wife and his amma at the same time. And one of the reasons for that is because in plural marriage, naturally there's going to be jealousy. Naturally. A man is married to more than one woman, they're going to naturally be married. The more deen, the more taqwa, the more akhlaq that they have, the better they're going to manage it, and the better it's not, the less it's going to get out of hand. So naturally it's going to happen. It happened with the wives of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or radiallahu anhunna. Now look at this. Why can't a man marry his wife and her khala or her amma? Because if there's going to be fitna, possible jealousy, it's not permissible, not permissible in this religion for there to be any animosity between a lady and her khala, 
a lady and her amma, not permissible. So Islam came and closed the door, didn't even allow it. You can't marry these two ladies at the same time to close the door of the fitna. Because in Al-Islam, there's that issue of nipping the problem in the bud before it even happens. Cutting it at the root. Islam cuts it off before the problem even happens. So from this, most of us are not going to get married to more than one woman at the same time. But you should take this lesson. This lesson goes to show it is not permissible for you to harm your khala or your amma. Islam closed the door from this marriage because it doesn't want that lady to be bothered at all. Not by you anyway. The khala and the amma, they're sacred. And if you can't bother the khala and the amma, then what about the mother even more? Islam came to take care of that issue. Islam came to take care of the women. Have rahmah on the women. The Nabi told the men, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how Islam had rahmah on the women. One day he was about to pray the salat of al-fajr and he looked in the audience and he saw that certain people were not there. Munafiqun, hypocrites. Salat al-fajr and salat al-isha are the two most difficult salats for the hypocrites to attend. He looked in the audience, they were not there. The Nabi said, Wallahi, if it wasn't for the women and the children, I would have taken some young men and I would have chose one of the men to leave the salah in my absence and I would have went with the young men and we would have burnt the houses down of the people who didn't come to the masjid. But because there were women and children in the homes, he didn't burn them down. Out of rahmah for those women and those children. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sometimes I start the salat and I want to read a surah very loud, but I start to hear a baby crying and I don't want the mother to be disturbed, so I shorten my prayer for that woman. These ahadith of the Nabi are impregnated with a lot of benefits. For an example, that hadith about him going and burning the houses down, not only is it a clear proof of the rahmah he had on the women, the Nabi just didn't say I would do this and he was hypothetically speaking. He said, if it wasn't for those women and the children in the homes, I'd have gone to the homes of the men and I would have burned their houses down. Which goes to show the masjid in the salat is wajib for the one who has the ability to come. He's close to the masjid and he hears the adhan. It's wajib. Or why would the Nabi threaten to destroy their property? Their property is haram. The other issue, and this is important, guys. We hear people always giving fatwas these days. The muhajirun, hizbu tahrir, different people just giving fatwas, fatwas. This is jihad, he's a kafir, he's a munafiq. One of the fatwas that really is quite disturbing because it makes life difficult for people unnecessarily is the fatwa, we should boycott Israeli products. We should boycott Coca-Cola. We should boycott Mountain Dew. We should boycott Pepsi. We should boycott this and boycott that. Why should we boycott it? Because it was those companies of the Jews. Now, if you want to boycott, if you want to boycott, you boycott and you don't purchase those products. But don't go out telling people that. Because you don't have the knowledge and the ability to look at the issue from all of the angles. It's not just your emotions. The Nabi said, if it wasn't for the children and the women, I'd have gone and burnt the homes down of those people. But... He can't burn, he would not burn the homes down of people who, they didn't do anything. So when you make that type of statement, let's boycott Pepsi and let's boycott this and that, you, where, where do you stop this issue of boycotting? Just because it's an Israeli product, why don't we boycott the camera? It's a Jewish company. Why don't we boycott some type of the computer? some computer component, some knowledge. Why don't we boycott the hospital where the guy in charge of the hospital is a Jew, the board of trustees are Jews. Why don't we boycott flying on the airplane? Where does it stop? So the Nabi didn't give these rulings just like that and he didn't act upon these rulings just based on desires. If it wasn't for those women and the children, yes, there are some people doing some things that are bad. These men are not attending the Salat of Al-Fajr. Something should be done to them. But because some other fa factors and variables, some peripheral issues, side issues, he didn't do anything because he has to look at the whole picture. And that's the justice of Al-Islam. And that's the Rahmah of the Nabi on people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had rahmah upon the Ajus. The Ajus is the old lady. 
and you don't call her Ajuza with a ta marbut at the end. Just Ajuz. Because a man is not called Ajuz. A man is called Sheikh. The Sheikh. Someone old in age. The woman, an old woman in Arabic is Ajuz. There was an Ajuz. Old lady bent over. She came and she said, Ya, ya Nabi. Ya Rasulullah. Am I going to go to Jannah? And am I going to go to Jannah? She was, oh, oh, oh. The Nabi said, no. The lady became worried, disturbed, sad. She started crying. She turned around and she started walking away. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the people, go and tell her. She's not going to go into the Jannah like that, old lady. She's going to go into the Jannah and she's going to be young. Because Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Inna anshatna hunna insha'a. When we put those women in the Jannah, the women who go to Jannah, we're going to make them young and vibrant. They're going to be youthful and exuberant. People won't be in Jannah 95 years old, 100 years old, like they were in this life when they were weak and decrepit and they were, they were, they were feeble. Not like that. They'll go into Jannah when they'll have whatever they want and they'll be able to move about and do whatever they want. There won't be that weakness there. So the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly in the hadith, he's taking care of the emotions and the feelings of the lady. And there are just too many examples. Ummu Hani. Ummu Hani, again, she was one of those tremendous companions. Tremendous companion. Ummu Hani. She memorized Surah Qaf from the mouth of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Al Islam was spreading, one of the powerful mushrikeen of Quraysh came to Umhani and said, Umhani, please, please protect me. Protect me. Give me protection. This is called Al-Ijar. Al-Ijar. Or Al-Istijar. The process where you're a person in the community, a non-Muslim comes to you. Back then, he comes to you and he says, hey, protect me, protect me from your tribe. Or protect me from these people. And because those people respect you, you say, hey, don't touch him. He's under my protection. The Prophet ﷺ was under the protection of his uncle, his grandfather. So Quraysh wouldn't do anything to him until they died. So many people would come to the Nabi and ask for his protection. They would go to Abu Bakr, ask him for his protection. Go to Umar, ask for their protection. But there wouldn't be something that they would do with a woman. Who is the woman? What are you talking about? That was not something in their society that a woman can protect someone. So one of the powerful kuffar people, he was a mushrik, he came and said, Um Hani, protect me, protect me. She said, okay, I'll give you protection. The men from the companion said, we're not listening to that. You can't protect him. You woman can't protect nobody. We're going to kill this man for what he did. We're going to kill this man for what he did. The Nabi, when he heard about the story, he came. He said, whoever Um Hani has given her protection for or to, I also protect them. Leave that man alone. And Allah revealed those eyes about this issue, the protection. When Ahadun min al mushrikeen istajara kafajirhu, hatta yasma kalam Allah. If one of the mushrikeen seek your protection, then give him protection so that he can hear the kalam of Allah, so that he can hear the dawah. You protect him, and no one else can do anything. He's divinely protected because the Muslim said, He's under my authority, my supervision. But you have to teach him about the religion and so forth and so on. So the point here is, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was ahead of the curve. In his society, he came with some seriously drastic changes that when the people looked at them, it was only people with true Iman who were able to get with the program. True Iman is like our culture. Like our culture. Our culture. Certain things that are taking place in the culture that go against the religion. Only people with true Iman have the ability to leave those things alone. In our culture, we're doing things like the girl, she has to get married to who we choose. You know, forced marriage, arranged marriage. If she gets divorced, the father, the brothers, the uncles won't help her to get married again. That's cultural stuff. The yarmi, the khatam, all of those things are cultural things. When the real Muslim is confronted with dalil, proof, that are against those things, they just stop it. But when the culturally oriented Muslim is confronted with it, his reply is the same reply as Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl. 
I'm not going to stop doing what I found my father's doing. My father married his cousin, and his father married her cousin, and my great-grandfather married his cousin, and on and on. And so I have to do the, you don't have to do the same thing. Not that I'm against that, or Islam is against that. Islam is not against people's culture. Islam is against the culture when the culture is against the deen. Opposite of the old lady is the young girl, the jariya. Too many examples of that. Too many examples of that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Al Eid, he was lying down in his room and Aisha, who was a very young girl, she had some of her friends over with her on the day of the Eid and they were singing songs, nursery rhymes, and not accompanied by music, just singing poetry, songs of the Arabs, talking about the generosity of the Arabs, the bravery of the Arabs, the history of the Arabs, the superiority and the nobility of Quraysh. They were just singing songs of things that had happened. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came in and Abu Bakr came and he, get that woman back on the other side. Nah, I'm just joking. She could stay there. Man. Some people, Ikhwani, they won't allow the little girl to come over here. But if you can see, Umar, he picked up the little girl, his little daughter, and he is Rahim with his daughter. Omar, stand up for a minute. Stand up for a minute. Please, 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 please. Please, please, please. You have to have Rahma on the niece. You have to have Rahma on the daughter. This right here is something that the men of Quraysh, they wouldn't do this right here. If he did that in public, the people would frown at him for holding a baby. The people would frown at him. One of the Nabis, his daughter lost her daughter. Zainab lost her daughter. The Nabi came and picked up the baby, the little girl. The baby was dying. Every breath would go out easily, but when the baby wanted to breathe in, she was struggling, trying to keep her life. She would exhale easily, struggle to breathe in. The Nabi started crying, started shedding tears. One of the men said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? Why are you crying? It's just a girl. The Nabi said, I can't help it if Rahma was taken out of your heart. I can't help it that Rahma was taken out of your heart. The fact that I'm crying and I'm dealing with the baby like that, it's just Rahma that Allah Azza put in the heart of an individual. And I can't help it if it's been taken out of your heart. In their society, the girl was just a commodity. Cook, clean, and just take care of the men, and that was it. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam expressed and manifested in front of the people Rahmah for those people. The little girl, Aisha, they were singing about the Nabi. Abu Bakr came in and said, do I hear the flutes of a shaitan in the house of the Nabi? You people are singing like that? The flutes of shaitan without any music. The Nabi, he sat up and he said, hey Abu Bakr, every group of people, they have an Eid, a day of enjoyment. And today is our Eid. Leave them. He let them have a good time. He lied back down. He laid back down. One of the little girls said in her poetry, We have a Nabi who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. The Nabi sat up and he said, Hey, don't say that. No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow except Allah. So although he was easy and gentle with people, and he had rahmah on people in the way he taught them. He never tolerated shirk. He never tolerated innovation. The rahmah of the jahil. We're going to do the ignorant one. Rahmah of the jahil. How the Nabi had rahmah on the one who doesn't know. Everybody here is ignorant to a certain degree. Everybody. How would you like for someone to be rough and tough with you? You don't know that you shouldn't drink with your left hand. You shouldn't eat with your left hand. So while you're doing that, someone comes and slaps it out of your hand. Or someone rebukes you and talks bad to you in front of everyone and disrespects you in front of everyone. You wouldn't like it. The Nabi, he knew how to deal with people like that. The Bedouin, the Bedouin who urinated in the masjid. He was ignorant. And the Nabi talked to him in the nice way. When the Bedouin was happy, the way the Nabi dealt with him, he made dua. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad. And don't have mercy upon these other people because they were going to hit the man. The Nabi, although he had Rahmah on him, 
just as he had Rahma on the little girls, when they say things that go against the deen, he had more Rahma by teaching them the truth. He said to that Bedouin man, don't make that dua. The Rahma of Allah is wide and expansive. How can you just put the Rahma on Allah of Allah on you and me? So teaching people, as we mentioned in the beginning, teaching people, giving nasiha, advising, this is from the Rahma. Rahma on your daughter, Rahma on your wife. So the Nabi, he had Rahma on those little girls. And too many examples with Aisha and other than Aisha, radiallahu anha, are clear indications. When he allowed Aisha to watch the Ethiopians, the Habashi people, in the masjid playing with the spears and moving around and dancing and doing their war dance. She said, I put my chin on the shoulder of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he would say to me, have you had enough? Are you full? Are you done? She said, I kept saying, no, I want to see more. I want to see more. She said, I didn't want to see more. I just wanted the people to know how he was with me and my position with him. He wasn't rough and tough with her. He was easy and gentle. He was easy and he was gentle. So the Rahmah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was clearly manifested with every category of woman in the Islamic society bar none. The grandmother, every single individual. The fact that the grandmother gets from the inheritance in Al-Islam depending upon who's present and who's not present. The grandmother gets money in the inheritance. Something unheard of. The rahmah of the Nabi on the woman is that she can't make jihad. Nor can she be killed in jihad. The lady came and said, Ya Rasulullah, the men, they go with you and they get all of the reward of jihad. He said, you women have jihad, but there's no fighting in your jihad. Anybody know what the jihad of the woman is? Anybody know? What is it? The hajj. That's jihad for the woman. That's a rahmah. The Nabi used to travel with his companions, and with him were his women, the man Anjasha. He was in front of the caravan, making the caravan go very quick, the way he used to sing those songs in poetry. The Nabi would say to Anjasha, radiallahu anhu, ya Anjasha, ruwayda suqqa, ruwaydan bil qawarir, take it easy and slow down with the vessels. Take it easy. And slow down and be gentle with the glass vessels. Meaning the women. If you keep driving like that too fast in this long journey, you're going to break them. Take it easy. Take it easy. Slow down. From the Rahmah of the Nabi on the women, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that they have a dowry. They have a dowry. When you get married to those women, give them a sadaqah, a dowry, a mahar. That's her haq. She does with it what she wants to do with it. She can marry who she wants to marry. From her haq is to get a khula, to get out of the marriage if she so chooses to exercise that option. Hukuk, rights, Islam came and liberated her. But the liberation that Islam gave her is not the liberation where the woman is outside of the home competing with men. She thinks she's the man. Not like that. That's not liberation. Liberation, the correct concept of liberation is she's been liberated to worship Allah in a way that Allah has prescribed for her and legislated for her. Wallahu a'lamu haythu yaj'ala risalata. Allah knows best how he made his religion. And those things that he allowed for women that he didn't allow for men and those things that he allowed for men that he didn't allow for the women this is from his knowledge and the woman who's liberated is the one who doesn't fight against that she doesn't say crazy statements I want to be able to marry two or three husbands no Allah didn't make it like that Allah didn't make it like that so both sexes have been commanded in the Quran to be satisfied with what Allah Ta'ala has given both sexes Allah has given the men a portion of inheritance and of the religion, things they have to do. And Allah has given the women a portion of their inheritance and their responsibility in the religion. So all of you should ask Allah for an increase of his virtues, his fadl. No man shouldn't want 
what the woman has and the woman shouldn't want what the man has. So these are some of the examples of how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam has come to take care of the rights of the women in looking into their issue and spreading on them and lowering upon them the wings of rahma. Waqfid lahum janah dhul. As Allah mentioned in the Quran, lower the wings of mercy over them, over the parents, and from them is the mother three times. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, ta'ala, few minutes before eight. If you brothers have any questions, you could put your questions forward now. When the Prophet was alive, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did the women have niqab? The answer to that is, Allahumma na'am. The women had niqabs. The proof of that are many hadith, but I give you one. Before the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prepared for the hajj, to go to hajj, he told the women, any woman who's going to put on her ihram, her clothes of ihram to perform hajj, she cannot wear gloves and she cannot wear the niqab. So that showed that they had niqab on. And if they didn't have niqab, why would he say that? Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Also, verses of the Quran, like the statement of Allah Ta'ala when he said to the women, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا let the women not show their zina, their beauty. Don't let them, Ibrahim, you with me, man? Don't let the women show their beauty except what must naturally appear. That, that they can't help it. It must appear. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the one who was the translator of the Quran from the companions, he said the part of the zina that must appear, that she can't hide, is that she's going to have one eye open. So that she can see where she's going. She has to have that one eye open. Which means the rest of her face is going to be covered. So no doubt the niqab was something that the Prophet's wives used to wear. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa radiyallahu anhunna. And it was something that was available. And it was being practiced during that time. And it's been practiced since that time. Now, nah? I didn't hear the question. Sorry, Sheikh. My question is the Prophet Joseph had a wife named Zuleha. She had twice Shabab. She was young again. She became young again to marry with this Prophet Yusuf. But she will be raised on their judgment whether she will be as a young or an old lady. Uh, first of all, it's very important that we understand when we talk about the people who came before, people of the Quran, Ad and Thamud, people of Nuh, Ahlul Kitab from before, Yaqub, Ishaq, Yusuf, Suleiman, Dawood, we have to, before we believe in anything, we have to make sure that those things are authentic because connected to our aqidah is from the ilm al ghaib, is from the ilm al ghaib, it's from the unseen. And we can't believe in anything that's unseen unless we have delil. So the Prophet, he told us about the stories of Ahlul Kitab. He said, If the Christians and the Jews, Ahlul Kitab, if they tell you things about religion, don't believe it and don't disbelieve it. If they tell you something, you can't believe it because you may believe something that's not true. If they tell you something, you can't disbelieve it because you may reject something that is true. So we have a minhaj. We have a minhaj, a methodology. When Adul Kitab tell us things about their religion, Jews, Yusuf did this, Joseph did that, did that, Jesus did this, Jesus. In our religion, if our religion supports it, we'll accept it. If our religion rejects it, 
we'll reject it. If our religion was quiet about it, we say Allahu A'lam. So I want you guys to be with me on this. Make sure you understand. The Bible, the Torah and the Injil, it said the first human being who was created, it was Adam. Do we believe in that or not? Okay. Because that's what our religion says. The Bible, the Injil, the Torah and the Injil, it said that Hawa, Eve, was created from the rib of Adam. Do we believe that? Yeah, we believe that. Because our religion told us that. Now, the Bible and the Christians, Al Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, they said Isa was the son of Allah and Uzair was the son of Allah. Do we believe that? No, because our religion rejected that. Our religion rejected that. Rejected it all together. In the Torah and in the Injil, it said that Suleiman, Suleiman, he was walking and he saw Bilqis. They call her Bilqis. We don't even say her name is Bilqis because we don't know the Dalil. Is it really Bilqis? No Dalil. She's the queen of Sheba, the queen of Saba. But in Arabic, they call her Bilqis. Okay, just like Zuleikha. We don't know if that lady's name is really Zuleikha. We don't have any Dalil to believe that. But anyway, the queen of Sheba, who was in the story of Suleiman, it said that this lady was so beautiful that when Suleiman saw her, she was worshiping the sun. So Suleiman was so impressed with her that he started worshiping the sun along with this woman so that she can marry him. Will we believe that? We don't believe that. Because a prophet, a rasul, he would never do something like that. Now, the third category. The Bible, the Torah, and the Injil said that the tree that Adam approached, the tree that he went to and he ate from, was an apple tree. As a result of that, we have this in our throats. Adam's apple. Was it an apple tree that Adam ate from? We don't say yes and we don't say no. The Quran didn't say apple tree, peach tree, pear tree, watermelon tree. I don't know if watermelons grow on a tree. But the Quran, the Sunnah didn't say what kind of tree. We just, so if someone came, the Jews, Christians said, yo, it's an apple tree. Wasn't it? I'm going to say Allahu A'lam. I'm not going to say yes or no because we don't know. So concerning... It's my mother. Hey, Ma. Ma, I'm in the class right now. 10, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. She was going to call me 8 o'clock. I'm sorry. 8 o'clock our time. So with this issue about Zuleikha, we don't know if her name was really Zuleikha, number one. There's no delil that Yusuf ever married her, number two. Number three, she was already married to another man, the Aziz of Egypt. That doesn't mean that she didn't get divorced or he died and they married Yusuf. But those stories in Islam, in the knowledge of Hadith, they're called Israeliyat. Israeliyat. And we don't take those narrations. They have to be authentic. And there was one companion who used to take a lot of those narrations. His name was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. He went to a sham and he lived in that area. He was sent there to teach. And when he met up with Arul Kitab in that area, he took a lot of their stories. And some of the companions criticized him for that. Some of the companions criticized him for that. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So these types of stories, we have to be careful. Don't take it unless our religion supports it. Don't reject it unless our religion rejected it. And if our religion didn't say anything about it, yay or nay, then you be quiet and say, Allah knows best. That's our minhaj concerning that issue. Asif. Awesome. Salaam If the wife requests from the husband to go to the masjid, is it an obligation for the husband to take her? The salat is not an obligation upon the woman to go in the first place. It's not an obligation upon him, on her. And as I mentioned, her salat in her house is better for her. But if she wanted to go, she shouldn't be prevented from going, but it's not wajib upon him to take her. It's not wajib upon him to take her. Not wajib. Because it's not something that Allah has put on him. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. 
Abdullah ibn Umar, he had a son, his name was Bilal, from the Tabi'een. And Bilal, he said to his wife, you can't go to the masjid anymore because the street going, it's fitna. Men are looking at you. There are bad people in the street. There's that. You can't go. She complained to Ibn Umar, his father, to Bilal's father, the companion Ibn Umar. Your son doesn't want to let me go to the masjid. And then Ibn Umar came and told his son Bilal, the Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tamna'u ama Allah min masajidillah. Don't prevent the handmaidens, the women, from going to the masajid, to the masjid. That's what the Nabi said. The boy Bilal said, Wallahi, I'm going to keep stopping her from going. I'm going to stop her because it's fitna out there. Ibn Umar said, I tell you the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you told me, Wallahi, you're going to go against it? Ibn Umar said, Wallahi, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And he boycotted his boy and he didn't take that boycott back until the boy died. So that hadith goes to show we can't stop them from going, but it's not wajib upon the husband to go with her to the masjid. It's not wajib upon him. Now, if there's some extracurricular activities going on, some peripheral issues, side issues, then it can become wajib in that case. Something on the side is happening, but it's not wajib upon him to take her to the masjid. Wallahu a'lam. It's not wajib. So there's a principle in Islam. The thing that the wajib is done only through it, the only way you can do that wajib is by doing this thing, then that thing becomes wajib. Because you can't do the wajib except if you have this thing there. You want to do a wajib? The only way I can get to this wajib is by doing this thing. If I don't use this thing or do this thing, I won't do it. Now this thing which normally is not an obligation, it becomes an obligation now to help you fulfill the obligation. But in her case, she wants to do something that's not wajib upon her. It's not wajib. So how is something external, like it becomes wajib on the, f the, the, the husband? This is not the case. Unless some other stuff is happening. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khairan Abu Usama for the informative lecture and inshallah we'll continue next Wednesday. One more question from Harun. Concerning this whole series that we're doing, talking about the Rahmah of the Nabi and the Nabi Rahmah, the Prophet of Mercy, and the mercy that he had, وسلم, we want to avoid being from the two extremes. One extreme are the people who go overboard in their so-called perceived love of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those people who say that he knows the ilm al ghaib those people who say that he's Hazir Nazir, those people who say that he never died, those people who said that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Nur of Allah, you're going overboard. You're going overboard. Those people who want to be the dog of the Nabi, the slave of the Nabi, making dua to the Nabi, that's going overboard. And the other extreme are the people. And pay attention, it's an extreme. That's extreme and this is extreme. The other extreme is the ones who say, ah, it's just a sunnah. It's just, is that wajib or the sunnah? It's just a sunnah. I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do that because it's just a sunnah. The people who... If people disrespect the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're indifferent. They don't care. They don't feel that they have a responsibility to be from the people of the Sunnah and the helpers of the Sunnah. Try to safeguard the Sunnah. And from the people who go under, the extreme the other way, they don't do enough in giving the haq that the Nabi has, not acknowledging the haq of the Nabi, is the people who when his name is mentioned, they never ever say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said in an authentic hadith, أبخر الرجل الذي إذا ذكرت عنده لا يسلم عليه. He said the most bakhil, 
the most cheap, stingiest person is the one who, when I mention, he doesn't say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He got on his member. He got on his member. He was walking on his member. His back was to his companions. He stepped on the first step. Then he said, Ameen. He stepped on the second step. He said, Ameen. He stepped on the third step. He said, Ameen. Then he turned around. He said, you want to know why I said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen? They say, yeah, why did you say that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, he, Jibril came to me on the first step. And Jibril said, Raghima anthim ra'in adrakat walidayhi aw ahaduhuma fi kibrihima falam yadkhul jannah. Qul ameen. He said, Jibril told me, the one who finds his mother and his father at old age, or one of them, and he doesn't go to jannah, May his nose be put in the dirt, may be destroyed. Say Amin. The Nabi said, Amin. He said, I got on the next step. And then Jibril said to me, Ragima anfum ri'an, the kirta indohu, falem you sallam ali. Fakul Amin. May the nose of the person be put in the dirt, destroyed, lowered, debased. You were mentioned, and he doesn't say, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say Amin. The Nabi said, Amin. And then the third time, on the third step, he said, Raghima anfum ri'an, dakhala ilayhi ramadan, falam yukhfir lohu. May the nose of a person be put in the dirt, may be debased, may be lowered, may be put down. Ramadan comes, and he doesn't get forgiven. Say, Ameen. The Nabi said, Ameen. So the Nabi made dua against the one who his name is mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he doesn't say it. And then Allah commanded in the Quran, in Allah, wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyu alladheena amanu sallu wa sallimu alayhi taslima. Allah commanded that in the Quran. So the scholars of Islam said, it's wajib for the person to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at least once in his life. And if there's a majlis where other people are there, then someone has to say it. If they don't say it, then they are all sinning. And lastly, as we always tell you, brothers and sisters, the scholars of Islam, they took this issue and they authored books just in this issue. The virtues of saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The virtues of it. The virtues of it. If a person goes to his job and he doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person goes to his office, a person goes to his place of business, he doesn't go, he goes in his home, he said any majlis, any sitting, that a Muslim has, any sitting, he changes this, the next place he's going to go. If he sits in that place and he doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that majlis is going to come as a source of his sorrow, yawm al qiyamah. So this is from the haq that the Nabi has upon us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, taslimin kathira. Good question, Harun al-Rashid.